stimulus packages, uh, the deleveraging, the um, new tax breaks, uh, infrastructure investment. But the question I leave you with here is, can cutting spending be reconciled with uh, growth imperatives? And that's the problem facing Europe and the crisis of sequestration and cutting entitlements and so forth in the United States. That's what is at stake here. Third set of issues, trade policy. Uh, at the same time that we talk about a renewed effort towards free trade, there's talk about transatlantic free trade area. The free trade area of the Americas has been talked about for 20 years. In ASEAN, they are moving towards the 2015 free trade agreement. Uh, but at the same time, everyone is practicing industrial policy, increasing subsidies to national champions, uh, and, and so forth. So I ask you, have we reached the high water mark of actual free trade? Fourth aspect of intervention, labor policy, the need for worker retraining, uh, tax abatements, bridging the skills gap. But here we face the challenge, what I call the double win, uh, continued outsourcing of labor uh, to, uh, to uh, emerging and frontier markets in, in manufacturing. In the United States, 15 million manufacturing jobs have been lost. But the double whammy is automation. When we talked in America about uh, outsourcing, when the complaints began to rise about outsourcing 10 or so years ago, no one talked about, uh, everyone talked about China, Chinese, and Indians. No one talked about robots. But now robots, robotic automation, is becoming uh, as big a culprit in a way if you look at the rising uh, job loss from that. So the question I leave you with there is, is global unemployment the new norm? Now I want to move ahead to looking at emerging markets. Uh, BRICS, the Next 11, Vista, Civets, every bank has its own uh, way of branding and packaging emerging markets. Um, I don't believe in any of this. Uh, I believe, uh, I mean, I certainly believe in emerging markets. I believe in Brazil and so forth. But I don't believe that you can simply look at the population size and multiply it by GDP growth and predict uh, stability. Uh, in fact, there's far more important uh, emerging country markets than just these 10 or 12. If you look at what, are, what some people just call the rest, the broader collective of 100 economies, right? They represent already almost 50% of world imports and almost 50% of world exports. Um, multinational companies from emerging markets are now rising to the top tier. This is the Fortune 100 list from 2012, which I wrote it out according to region. And you can clearly see that um, uh, that the number of Asian uh, multinationals, some of which are of course stable enterprises, are, uh, are increasing in market cap and, uh, and stretching across internationally. Um, a lot of these, of course, do come from Asia. I want to highlight uh, infrastructure. Uh, because what you see here, when we think of globalization, you don't often think of railways and roads. But the huge share of, of Asian infrastructure investment that is uh, going to cities an additional component, particularly in China, is going into transportation infrastructure. Whenever China announces a new infrastructure stimulus package, uh, um, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of that, kind of that go into railways and other kinds of transportation infrastructure, which is extremely important for uh, promoting, in a way, China's uh, domestic uh, stability and its international uh, expansion. Now, if you saw the news last week that China has taken over the operation of Gwadar Port in Pakistan, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because uh, it's places like Gwadar that, uh, that I put on this map. You can look at the, uh, the yellow dot right there. That's the Gwadar Port in Pakistan. And I've been writing about this for seven or eight years. And every, every year you might see in the news that China has taken over this infrastructure or that infrastructure. Chances are it's on this map because it's part of their long-term uh, strategy. Um, I need to move a bit more quickly, but the, um, the, the Middle East uh, situation, I mentioned that, of course, uh, you know, um, uh, Egypt has obviously disappointed investors, but those who look at the structural uh, situation in the Middle East, in terms of the population size and the need for infrastructure investment, uh, you can clearly see that it is a, a, an important long-term market opportunity, especially when it comes to thinking about investing in infrastructure that can help to develop cross-border markets there. Uh, let's talk also about Africa. I mentioned uh, already the, uh, the statistics around Africa's growing multi-directional uh, trade and investment flows uh, with the United States, uh, with Europe, and now also uh, with uh, Latin America. Um, 
Why is infrastructure so important, as I've, as I've repeatedly been mentioning? Well, if you look at the correlation to growth rates, uh, it really is one of the single best predictors of long-term economic growth is, in fact, infrastructure uh, investment. Uh, with very few outliers, you can see that the countries that we have uh, been celebrating in the emerging market world, such as Malaysia, uh, China, Vietnam, and so forth, have been countries that have investing, been investing 10% 10, 10 or more of their GDP in infrastructure. India has not been doing that, Nigeria has not been doing that, and Brazil has not been doing that. But here's the problem. It takes years to really experience the benefits of infrastructure investment. If Brazilian infrastructure investment is low today, which it is, and you start to make the major infrastructure investments that have been announced by this new government over the last exactly two years, $100 billion I've, I've calculated have been announced in. Port modernization, 34 ports that you have, all new airports that are supposed to be built, raising money from privatization, roads, railways, $100 billion of infrastructure investment have been promised uh, by this government in this country uh, for the next 10 years. But you have to be making those investments today if you want to see the impact on your growth rate. Uh, and because the infrastructure investment has been so low, uh, the, the growth rate at the moment right now is very low, and it may not rise for some time because the infrastructure is not there to support uh, the growth. Uh, interest rates also are obviously having um, a, uh, an impact on the economy because, uh, because the, um, the real rates are very, very high and have been crowding out some of this investment. I'll move forward because I know that this is going to come up in, um, in a subsequent uh, presentation. Uh, the reliance, of course, on commodities prices an environment where the currency is very strong. And this that has been a, a diversified economy, certainly by emerging market standards, a very diversified economy, is being undercut in some areas because of the strength of the currency. There, so there's a need now to think about liberating, in a way, capital in this country, focusing on not only the things that have been done, capital markets that have been, been, uh, been quite orderly in Brazil, um, uh, the sovereign debt market that has grown, but the importance of uh, fixed investment in particular and moving towards um, uh, promoting more, uh, more investment in infrastructure uh, by the private sector. And those are some of the priorities that I know have been outlined, but they need to be executed very, very rapidly. To say nothing, of course, of the uh, World Cup and Olympics coming up. Those are just uh, events. They happen, they happen once, and they don't necessarily serve the entire country. Uh, so we have to think much more, much more deeply. Um, let me move ahead and just set you a reminder, in a way, of go circling back right again, this notion of chain reactions, right? Um, there are more. We talked about three or four at the beginning from 2011, 2012, that we're still feeling the impact of today. What about the Iran conflict? What about another natural disaster? What about the splintering of Iraq now that the U.S. has withdrawn? Collapse, maybe, of North Korea? And there's more. A pandemic, the U.S. fiscal cliff, a world conflict in the South China Sea, and so forth. The scenario is really never ending that you would conjure up in your mind. I think we have all day actually to discuss about some of them, what impact they may have on Brazil. But I wanted to just mention a few that are commonly discussed. And it's very difficult in any of these cases to trace the supply chains, the complexity of supply chains, and how they might potentially affect Brazil. And so you have to ask yourself, what issues do you need to pay attention to that you are not? Which competitors may be ahead of you in thinking through some of these challenges? What technologies can help you that you may not yet be leveraging? And which trends are going to require you to adjust your geostrategy the most? Geostrategy is a term that we tend to relate to governments, the foreign policy and diplomacy. But companies have to have their own geostrategies as well. I hope that over the course of today, uh, this conversation and the, the dialogues that we're going to have will help you as businesses to craft a better geostrategy for a very volatile world. Thank you very much.